Hello and welcome to Tech Deals, part two of the $800 i3-8350K system build. Sort of a modified Y vlog, not really. It's all just about the CPU. We're not going to talk about the rest of the parts. This is a change of plans. This was originally going to be the overclocking video, and then part three was going to be the game performance. As you can see here, the system is already built. I have already overclocked it. I'll give you a couple of spoilers here. The details, temp tests, and everything else will be in its own dedicated video, but I'll give you the short version of this video. Game performance will also get its own dedicated video with charts and numbers and minimums, five different games tested, but I'll give you some spoilers here as well, so stick around if you just want some basics there. But first, I want to talk about the CPUs and respond to some of the comments you made, or maybe four of you made, in the part one of this video series as to how absurd it is in 2018 to build a four-core, four-thread, $800 build, especially with a GTX 1050 Ti. Fair enough, I understand. So after reading those comments, I thought, well, why don't I do a modified Y vlog? I'll address your questions, give you some information about the build of it, talk a little bit more about the CPUs, and mention a few things I didn't talk about in the first video, one of which I simply neglected, and one of which was a good point from some of you in the comments below. But before we get to that, you might notice that the white Galax GTX 1050 Ti is sitting on top of the computer. Inside the computer, we have an EVGA 1050 Ti. This doesn't happen very often. That card is completely dead. Would not power up a signal, would not come up whatsoever. The system did not even recognize it being in the machine, even to the point to where the integrated video was functioning. I played around with it, couldn't figure out why it wasn't turning, why it wasn't coming on, played with the ports, tried different cables, finally, tried plugging it into the motherboard, worked perfectly. Pulled it out, stuck the EVGA card in, worked like a champ. Stuck that in another machine, dead as a doornail. It is extremely where the video card is dead out of the box. Doubly so when it's a product sample from a manufacturer. Galax sent me that card to review and it simply doesn't work, so that's a bit odd. In any case, it does happen, but it's pretty rare, and so I've emailed them and I'm sure I'll get a rope well. The 10 series is kind of coming to an end. They might say, don't bother at this point. It looks nice, but since the 20 series is coming soon, maybe they'll send me one of those instead. Although I will ask him to send me a 10 because maybe I'll do a 10 versus 20 Galax comparison in the future. That's neither here nor there, but I wanted to explain why the change of video card and simply it's that. Now, before we get to the rest of the build of this, and I'll talk about it briefly later, I really want to talk about the CPUs because that's really the entire point of this. In fact, one of the best comments left beneath part one of this video series was, aren't you making a lot of compromises to get a five gigahertz or a 20% boost in clock speed over say the standard chips? Yes, and that's the whole point of the build. No, most people don't need five gigahertz. Most games, most applications, most users will not see a tangible benefit going from four gigahertz to five gigahertz. But some of you will, and that's what this build is all about. It's about when clock speed is king and cores are not. About two months ago, I did a $900 Ryzen 7 1700 build on my channel. $100 more than this, but to be sure, for most people, a much better machine. Eight cores, 16 threads, 3.7 gigahertz on the included stock cooler, easy overclock. I've done that with multiple chips and multiple boards. A six gigabyte GTX 1060, all the way around a better build than this one for the average person. The average person is not every person. Do you want to play League of Legends, Overwatch, World of Tanks, Star Wars The Old Republic, Rocket League? I have tested all five of those games on a variety of hardware. I have now tested those on these. The results won't be in this video, but I'll give you a spoiler alert. This computer is faster in those five games than that Ryzen 7 1700 is. It is very easy to say that there's a better value in the Ryzen chips, and there is most of the time, but it all depends upon what you want to do with your computer. There are a million Ryzen builds out there. I've done numerous ones on my channel, multiple Ryzen 7 and multiple Ryzen 5 builds. 
This is a niche product, but my hope is that it's interesting to some of you. And some of you may say, you know, I don't want to play 52 different games. I don't want to play Call of Duty Black Ops 5. I don't want to play Battlefield 5. I'm not interested in every latest and greatest AAA game. Shadow of the Tomb Raider isn't even on my radar screen. I just want to play some shooty boats in World of Warships. I want to play some World of Tanks or War Thunder. I want to play some online MMOs. And I just want really good performance while I do it. This will do it. Now, while we're discussing four cores, four threads, let me introduce you to the i3-8100 because a couple of you mentioned that the i3-8100 in the comments beneath the first video. Four cores, four threads, it's less expensive by about $50. It also comes with a stock cooler, which is perfectly adequate. You don't have to replace it. It, it really is fine. So you save $50 on the chip and you save $50 on the cooler absolutely true. It takes this $800 computer and reduces it to $700. And it reduces your potential clock speed from 5 gigahertz to 3.6. On CPU bound games, League of Legends, I'm looking at you, that makes a dramatic and noticeable difference to performance. In fact, on League of Legends, even the 1050 Ti was hardly even running at 50% usage. It was all CPU bound. So clock speed is all that matters. Now I posted screenshots of some of these benchmarks to Twitter the other day and I asked everybody, so what do you see here? And several people said, well, wait a minute, both the CPU and the GPU are not running at 100%? What's going on? The CPU is running at about 50% because League of Legends only uses two cores. In fact, a two-core chip, would uh, the, uh, the previous chip, the i3-7350K at 5 gigahertz was two cores, four threads, would basically be the same performance as this. Now, I don't recommend anybody run out and buy that at this point. I mean, why? This exists. But if you had one and you were playing League of Legends, upgrading to this would do nothing for you at the same clock speed because those extra two cores aren't doing anything because the game doesn't use them. Here's an interesting thought for you. If you want to live stream League of Legends 1080p high detail at hundreds of frames per second, this computer will do it using OBS's GPU encoding absolutely smoothly with basically no performance impact. You have two spare cores that are basically not being used and the graphics card's only being 50% utilized and it's at hundreds of frames per second. You could, with this, live stream World of Tanks. Now you'd want to limit the frame rate to 60 frames per second to leave some GPU encoding headroom because it was using all the GPU, but it was running at hundreds of frames per second. Star Wars The Old Republic. Uncapped frame rate. You could live stream that on this computer with virtually no performance deficit. No second computer required, no hardware capture card required. It would do it just fine with a 1050 Ti and an i3-8350K. Now, it's not going to do that on Battlefield 5 or Battlefield 1 or probably even Battlefield 4 for that matter. Haven't tried it, but it probably wouldn't. But it will do those games. So if that's what you're interested in, if those are the kind of games that you play, that's really all that you need. Now, one of the comments that many people made is, well, if you're already spending $800, at least get the i5. It's not that much more. Well, it is and it isn't. It's $80 more, so it's 10% more money but it is 50% more cores. And there's something to be said for that. 50% more cores, a little bit more future-proofing, maybe live stream a little bit more demanding games. Overwatch would live stream just fine on this limited to 60 frames per second after all, which is what Twitch and YouTube supports anyway. And Mixer, I always forget about Mixer. But you could go out and spend $80 on this. But let me ask you a question. Is it a deal to spend $80 more on a CPU that will provide you exactly zero additional performance. The five games that I just mentioned, World of Tanks, League of Legends, Overwatch, Rocket League, and Star Wars The Old Republic, would perform exactly zero different on an i5-8600K versus an i3-8350K. Zero, zilch, not one ounce of difference. None of those games, and none of a whole lot of other games as well, will perform any better on a six core chip than they will on a four. Three years from now, yeah, that might change. 18, years from, 18 months from now, who knows? But right now, 
there's no difference. So you're spending $80 for what? To maybe, hopefully, in the future, at some point, have a difference? That's your personal preference. I understand. But the benefit of this, the unlocked Cade chip over the 8100, which numerous people mentioned, for $100, you go from essentially 3.6 gigahertz to up to 5 gigahertz. Now, this brings me into a really nice segue of overclocking. I will do a dedicated video on overclocking. I captured ADA64 stress tests. I captured the BIOS and the settings I used in there. So that deserves its own video. This chip does not do 5 gigahertz. It doesn't do 5 gigahertz regardless of the settings, voltage, etc. It's not a temp problem. I'm not temping out. It simply doesn't do it. It blue screens before Windows even initializes. I tried everything up to 1.45 volts, 1.4, 1.35, didn't make any difference. This chip, this specific chip, will not do 5 gigahertz. This will do 5 gigahertz. My i7 will do 5 gigahertz. This i3 won't. Your mileage may vary. You might very well buy an i3-8350K and it will do 5 gigahertz. You might buy it and it will only do 4.6 or 4.7. Overclocking is not guaranteed. I think there's become a mindset in the past 10 years with all these K chips and unlocked processors. Yeah, sure, Z boards over, uh, unlocked and overclocked. So sure, everybody can overclock. And you can to a point. But how much you get is not guaranteed. I got 4.8. But there is a noticeable performance increase from 4.0, which is the stock speed of this, to 4.8, and most certainly from 3.6 to 4.8. And for certain people who want to run at hundreds of frames per second, because those games are all basically CPU bound at the resolutions and details that I was running them at, 1080p high detail for all of them, then the extra, in this case, 1.2 gigahertz of clock speed does make a difference. Now, we're going to come back to the Intel chips in just a second because I have one more to show you, but Ryzen 5, Ryzen 5 1600 out of the box actually has fairly low clock speeds, which is why setting it to 37 multiplier or 3.7 gigahertz makes a lot of sense. Ryzen 5 2600 already runs at 3.7 out of the box. And frankly, I think if you buy a Ryzen 5 2600, you should just leave it there. The amount of overclocking headroom the chip has on the stock cooler is virtually zero. And the amount of overclocking headroom you have when you spend stupid amounts of money on cooling is not much better. So it, it really doesn't make sense to overclock the second gen Ryzen chips. The Ryzen 5 2600 X does go a bit higher, about 200 megahertz higher. 300 megahertz higher, if you put a 360 millimeter liquid cooler on it, I know because I've done that. I've got a, a Cooler Master Master Liquid back there that I've done. I need to make the video on that, but I have done those tests. Yeah, it, it doesn't do as much as you think it does. So the deal is the Ryzen 5 2600. It's about $165, 3.7 gigahertz out of the box. No need for any manual overclocking, runs cool and quiet, but it has the same problem that the i3-8100 has. 3.6, 3.7, if you're running CPU bound games, those clock speeds cannot compete with 4.8 or 5.0, depending upon your silicon lottery luck. They just don't. It's too much of a clock speed difference, deficit. League of Legends will be faster on a 4.8 gigahertz chip than it will on a 3.7. It just will. And if those are the kinds of games that you play, all the cores and threads in the world don't do anything for you. They're nice, and they'll be great for Battlefield 5, they'll be great for Black Ops 4, they'll be great for multitasking, for video encoding, video editing, 3D animation. They'll be great for a lot of things for many, many years to come. They just won't run League of Legends at hundreds of frames per second. Well, it, it will, but in the low hundreds versus the multiple hundreds. We'll save the benchmark results for the next, actually, part four, but... Let's just say that uh, multiple hundreds of frames per second are possible when you have enough clock speed. Let's put Ryzen aside for a minute because I've talked about Ryzen to death. This is what I want to talk about. The i5-7600K. Four cores, four threads. DDR4-2400 support. DDR4-2400 support. DDR4-2666 support. 
the Coffee Lake six core chips are new dies. They have to be because they haven't done six core dies on the consumer platform. Six cores, six threads on the i5, six cores, 12 threads on the i7s, but they're really the same chip. It's the i5s just have hyper threading disabled, but they are physically the same chip, the i5s and i7s. This is not the same chip. This is four cores, four threads. And it does not support DDR4-2666 officially the way all the other Coffee Lake chips do. Why? Could it be that this is really just a rebadged i5-7600K? I believe it is. In fact, clocked the same performance. These are basically the same performance chip. Here's the interesting thing. Not that long ago, about a year ago, there were quite a few people who were perfectly happy to go out and spend $240 on an i5-7600K, put it on a Z270 motherboard in the $100 to $140 or whatever price range for four cores and four threads and overclock it to the 4.6 to 5.0 gigahertz range depending upon your luck, cooling, etc. And to say, I got a pretty good gaming machine because i5s are pretty good gamers. And they have been for a long time. Here's the funny thing. Change the name to an i3, increment the generation a bit, introduce everybody to multi-core chips with the Ryzen and the six cores, and all of a sudden everybody laughs at it and says, well, it's just an i3. No, it isn't. It's an i5-7600K. What's a shame is it doesn't work in the 100 and 200 series boards. And I suspect that if it weren't BIOS locked out by Intel, it would. It Because it probably underneath the core and inside the internal guts of the chip, it probably is just a rebadged 7600K. And so... What you could theoretically do is take a Pentium dual core or an older i3 or something that's a dual core on a 100 or 200 series uh, motherboard and just drop an i3-8350K in and actually have quite a nice machine, but you can't because Intel. So 240, 170, same chip, new generation of boards, the games that it's good on, were out when this was out. So, so long as you don't want those new games, if you were even remotely considering this a year ago, why is that such a bad option? Ryzen? Clock speed. Do you want high clock speed? Do you want high frame rates? And this brings up an important point. If you're okay with 60 frames per second, if you're okay with 100 frames per second, this entire conversation is moot. Star Wars The Old Republic Player versus Player War Zones notwithstanding, because that's a special case. If all you care about is getting 100, even 140 frames per second in, say, League of Legends, yeah, this is all ridiculous. A Ryzen 3 2200G will do that. An i3-8100 will do it. Heck, a Pentium G5400 will do that. Those chips are $65. The whole point here is maximum frame rate in games that are CPU limited. Now that's enough CPU talk, and I hope this has maybe answered some questions, at least to the people who wanted a, let's just say basically wanted to beat the dead horse. So I've beat the dead horse. I'm gonna push these CPUs aside. Let's talk about the build a little bit. First things first, the case. Now I've previously done a video on this case, but when I did the video on the case, I hadn't done a, a build in it at the time. So let me talk to you about building in this case, the Corsair Spec 04. Now, parts of it are really nice. The motherboard mounting posts were already installed, and some cases, Cooler Master looking at you, the mounting posts don't come pre-installed, and they're kind of a pain to install. So much so that I've actually bought a little socket wrench with a little head to the size of the uh, motherboard mounting posts to simply be able to get those on easily because some of them can be kind of stubborn. And when you do as many builds as I do at some point, having a socket wrench for that actually is really, really nice because doing them with your thumb sucks. So those posts are already installed. Putting the motherboard in was easy as a dream. There is a fixed peg right here about in the middle. So when you put the motherboard in, it rests on it. You don't actually screw that middle one in, it sits on it. And so the motherboard doesn't just slide around on the posts. I think this is a really good design because what it means is that you're not scratching up the bottom of your board as you try to uh, move it in and try to get it into place. It pops down on the post and the board just stays there. No worries. IO shield in the back, uh, not a problem. What whatsoever. Frankly, it was easy to install. Power supply, also easy to install. There's no shroud or cover or anything else. It just simply slid down in there, went back, screwed the four screws in the back, 
no big deal. There's a single fan in the front with a single connector. It simply ran around the back, plugged into the board. No problem there as well. The front panel connectors are kind of interesting. There's a single USB 3 and a single USB 2 connector on the front. But inside, there's just the standard USB 3 connector. So that was kind of weird. Why are they not both USB 3 ports? Actually, they might be. I could be wrong about that, although only one is labeled super speed and only one is blue, so go figure. But I plugged it in and they work. Well, the blue one works, so there you go. As far as the drive installation, that was very simple. These are toolless, they slide right out. The case comes with the screws to install two and a half inch SSDs there. Hard drives don't require tools, but you just simply have to mount the four screws to the bottom. Those went in very, very easily. Cable management. Cable management sucks. The fact of the matter is if you want pretty cable management, you need more case than this because the eight pin CPU power connector, there's no way to route it behind the motherboard. There's no hole up here in the back. So it's just resting on the top of the motherboard. Well, that's the host of the liquid cooler. It's just resting up here on the top of the motherboard. There's no place to put it. The cable management for that eight pin connector is pretty bad. The 24 pin main ATX connector is not too bad. You can see it looped over here. That basically you simply have to loop it through uh, the cable management loops here until you can get it to come around on the board. That's okay. As far as the front panel connectors, you can see the front panel audio connector right there we go. I have to kind of reach around and try to do it by feel. Um, it just rests on top of the power supply. There's no routing for it. There's no shroud or protection for it. But the, the, the space behind the motherboard tray, the space behind the back panel is pretty dreadful. Um, in fact, tell you what, let me take it off and turn it around and show you just how dreadful it is. Here you can see the wonderful mess of cables. You can see all the stuff for the various SSDs I installed. In the first video, I said I was installing one extra SSD that wasn't in the price. I ended up installing three. In addition to the Mushkin Triactor, which I did install, which is on the top, I installed the two AdLink drives that I've recently reviewed, the S20 and the S50. One of those is a TLC, one of those is an MLC, but they're both 256 gigabytes. I actually have those rated or striped in, uh, in uh, disk management within Windows. Not for performance, it really, they're, they're not any faster that way. It's simply to give me a single larger drive letter rather than having a bunch of little drives. I would have actually done them all together, but different sizes, then you don't do striped, you do spanned, and I thought about it. It simply was to give me a terabyte of SSD in here because rather than using my external storage, I went ahead and installed those games that I mentioned before. Star Wars Yoda Republic, League of Legends, World of Tanks, uh, Rocket League, and Overwatch are actually installed on the computer, not running on my external uh, testing drive. So I'll put a few others on here as well. I'm not gonna take this apart. I'm actually gonna use this machine. I know some people are gonna say, well, come on, where's the deal in that really? No, for a lot of uses, this is enough. For the kind of games my kids play, this is enough. In fact, this would make a really good computer for my kids because all those games I just mentioned are all they do. They also do Roblox, Minecraft, and games like that, none of which need six core 12 thread processors. They really don't and won't for some time to come. You can see up here the back of this CPU. Um, this is the plastic thing that uh, Corsair provides for the H50 liquid cooler. Installing that was not difficult at all. In fact, let me turn this. Installing it was as simple as putting the four long screws through here, taking the fan and simply putting them through, and then taking the radiator and screwing it on. Simple as that. Then you install this back plate here by simply pushing it through the four holes on the board. Then you take the actual um, pump, the actual uh, liquid cooler pump, stick it onto the CPU, and then take the four thumb screws and screw it down. It's 15 minutes tops for the whole thing. It was very easy to put on. Turning it back this way, just to talk about the cable management right here. Yes, this is a mess of cables, but there's no real channel. There's no cover. There's no slots and there's no depth here. You really can't run anything here because there's no Z depth. The edge of the case, I can't even, well, I can just barely put a finger in here. You can't put fingers up here. So it's not great. Let me offer you this thought. Before you get upset, if you're the kind of person who gets picky about cable management, fine, buy a $100 case. This is not a $100 case, this is a $50 case. Buy a Corsair Obsidian 450D or 750D and you'll have spectacular cable management or one of many other brands, you could certainly do that. But for $50, it is what it is. Let me offer you this thought. Temps in overclocking with all this cable management were not a problem. Temps did not limit my overclocks, voltage and just 
Silicon Lottery limited my overclock. This thing runs cool and quiet, even at 4.8 gigahertz. The fan never got loud enough. I had this sitting on the desk right back there, plugged into this monitor that you can see right here while I was playing and testing. This computer was two feet away from me. The side panel was off on the desk, overclocked to 4.8 gigahertz, never a sound issue. I was genuinely happy at how relatively quiet these Corsair fans in this were. I'm not happy with all Corsair fans. It's hit and miss sometimes, but the one included in this case and the one included in this cooler, I can genuinely tell you, did not bother me open air on the desk next to the monitor while I was sitting here playing the game. Because I did all the benchmarking right here. I didn't take them downstairs to my normal test bench. Um, I did the recordings in the part four of this when you actually, when I show you all the benchmarks, and I show you the live gameplay of those. I have an Elgato HD60S capture, uh, external capture device plugged into my Skylake X system, which is down under the desk right here. And so basically I have the, there's a separate monitor you can't see right here. And so it did the recording. So this machine didn't even know it was being recorded. I also used MSI Afterburner to do the benchmarking this time. Fraps has been retired. No more benchmarks with Fraps. That actually has made things really nice uh, because MSI Afterburner does it internally and provides the 1%, 0.1% average min-max numbers. And it gets rid of a lot of compatibility issues. So I think Fraps Day has passed. In any case, let me turn this back around. Now, what would I do differently if I was building this again and maybe picking my own parts? Because a lot of these parts were in fact sent to me by the various companies. ASRock sent me the board, Corsair sent me four things from this. What would I do differently? As I mentioned in part one of this video series, EVGA's BT450, uh, which at the time of filming is $29. It is half the price of the Corsair. It's a great modular power supply, but to be blunt, if I was building this machine, I'd put the 450 watt EVGA in for $30 less. I, I would save $30 there. The case, I have no problem with this case. Yeah, cable management sucks, but whatever. It doesn't matter. It does the job. It is large enough to be easy to build in, but not so large to just take up tons of space. It's relatively slim, relatively short. It has good, strong feet. Speco 1 and Speco 2 cases had the round, knobby feet, which were plastic. And actually, my Speco 1 build downstairs, one of the feet has actually broken off. These aren't going to break off. These are much, much better feet. It's got a nice look to it. I, I like this case for $50. It's just fine. Would I get the tempered glass version? No, I don't really care. I'd rather have the plastic. It'll make it way less and one less thing to worry about breaking. Would I go with the liquid cooler? No, I really wouldn't. And this is a comment that was brought up by a number of viewers of part one of this video. What would I do? Cooler Master Hyper 212 Evo. You can often find them for $20, $25. Now you don't have to go with that. Uh, there are, uh, Cryorg makes several and there's various other brands you can find in the 20 to $25 price range. The four heat pipe direct contact coolers will cool this chip just fine. You may or may not get 4.8 to five gigahertz. I would take 4.6 to 4.7, save 25 to $30 on the cooler, and frankly, in many regards, it'd be just as easy of an install. The Hyper 212 Evo's actual mounting kit isn't that great, but I've done it enough times now, it's not too big a deal. This is probably an easier install than that, but the Cryorg and a few others are pretty easy to install as well. I kind of wish that Intel would go the route of AMD and include nice stock coolers with their chips. If this were $169, which it is, but it came with a cooler similar, to what the Ryzen chips come with. If it came with a decent cooler that you could actually use out of the box and even mildly overclock, I would get a lot, I think a lot of people would get more excited. But the fact that it doesn't come with a cooler at all, I completely acknowledge that it hurts the value proposition. Because it isn't $170, it's $220 because the chip plus a $50 cooler. So you spend $30 on a cooler and it makes it $200, it makes it a bit better. But there's nothing wrong with the liquid cooler. I just don't know that it makes... I understand the logic when people said that's a lot of money to spend on a 120 millimeter cooler. I, I get it, but it does the job and hey, it leaves a bunch of free airflow here for everything to move around. Would I still buy this motherboard? Maybe. It's a good motherboard that gives good upgrade options. If you ever had any desire in the future to buy a used i7 8700K chip, you'd want a board like this. 
This has, you know, I'm not looking at it. I think it's a 10 phase power delivery system compared to the $100 boards, which are $40 less, which don't have a 10 phase power system. This is much more likely to give you a good solid overclock. It has two M.2 slots. It's got a variety of features that the $100 boards don't have. It's a nice, nice board. If you don't want this, you could certainly go with MSI, Gigabyte, etc. Take your pick, but uh, it, it's a good, nice board for overclocking. The main SSD is one of the biggest things I'd change. I mentioned this in part one of the video. This is a 128 gig drive. I wouldn't buy a 128 gig drive. I had this on the shelf because I, I did a video showing performance and comparing it to the SU800, 256 at least. The price difference is $15 between 128 and 256. This makes no sense. I mean, I added more SSDs just to give myself some more space, but you could put a slightly bigger SSD in there and perhaps have that be your only SSD. So that, and you'd certainly solve a lot of cable mess back here if you didn't have all those SSDs installed. Finally, the last big change. Would I put a GTX 1050 Ti in here? No, I wouldn't. I would put a 1050 in here. I don't think the extra two gigs of VRAM is worth the cost difference at the moment. You can currently get GTX 1050s for really close to $100. Not quite, but really close. An RX 560 would also be an adequate card, uh, two or four gig depending upon the price, but somewhere in the $100 to $120 price range would be plenty. I fully acknowledge that 1050 Ti's are not really a good deal and that the RX 580, which I mentioned in part one of the video, really is a better value in the long run but it wouldn't make any difference to most, not all, but most of the games that I've tested on this machine. In fact, the 1050 would be fine. So if all I cared about is, for example, what my kids are gonna play with this, Overwatch, League of Legends, uh, World of Tanks, World of Warships, etc., Minecraft, Roblox, etc., which they do, uh, Sims 4, my daughter loves the Sims 4, a 1050 would be plenty. Although while we're talking about my kids, let me be completely blunt. The i3-8100 with the GTX 1050 would be plenty for my kids because they have 60 hertz monitors. They don't care about 200 frames per second, which yes, this will do from time to time plus. So if you have a 1080p 100, uh, 240 hertz monitor, they do exist now. Yeah, you need five gigahertz. It really does make a difference. But putting that aside, my kids don't. The, the liquid cooling and the K chip for what my kids do is silly. I have a YouTube check channel, so I do these things, so one of them will probably end up with this. In any case, that's pretty much it with the build so far. Let me briefly talk about overclocking both memory and CPU. I will admit, first of all, this video is already much longer than I meant it to be, but second of all, talking about this in this video might dissuade some of you from watching part three, which will go into it in more detail. Fair enough. And some of you might want the short, sweet version, although this video is not the short and sweet version. However, 4.8 gigahertz is the most I got on the CPU. I tried 1.35, I tried 1.4, I tried reluctantly 1.45, which I don't like doing. I think it's too much voltage, but I did it because, well, I wanted to see if it would work. None of them would even post to Windows. As soon as the main ASRock logo appeared, and as soon as the little circle at the bottom for Windows 10 tried to load, boom, instant blue screen. The messages varied, nothing I did made a difference. 4.8 gigahertz at 1.35 is stable most of the time. It was stable all of the time at 1.375. Temps, reasonable enough mid 70s under A to 64 stress testing, but as you will see in part four of this video, in the game benchmarks, way below that. So it's not a temp issue. It's just the chip just won't do over 4.8 gigahertz. Say la vie. RAM, this is DDR4-2133, CAS rating or CL13. When I went in and changed it to 2400, not changing any of the other settings, it completely froze. It would not boot. 2666, of course, wouldn't boot either. Changed the CL rating to 15, and it booted just fine. Now, I did 15, 15, 18, 38 on the various settings. DDR4-2666 ran just fine on this RAM at those settings. You could probably tighten them up a bit. I mean, there comes a point... What I was not trying to do was tweak it to death to find the absolute max performance or max speed that this particular RAM would run at. Here's why. 
If you go out and buy 16 gigs of Corsair Vengeance LPX DDR4 2133, your mileage will vary. You might set it to 15, 15, um, 18, 38, excuse me, 17. 15, 15, six, I'm not looking into the numbers right now, but I have them on the computer. 15, 15, 17, 38. I'll show them to you in the BIOS when, I, when we do the next video. You might not get 2666. And the next question people will ask is, well, what about 3,000? What about 3,200? If you really want 3,200, go buy 3,200. That's a monster overclock. 2,666 is as high as I pushed it. And off of 2,133, that's a fairly healthy overclock. It was stable at 4.8 gigahertz, 1.375 volts fixed with an AVX offset of three, meaning when the FPU and the AVX instructions are running, it's running at 4.5 instead of 4.8. Very important point. I'll talk about more detail next video. And 1515, 1738, DDR4 2666, good to go. Was it any faster at 2666 with those settings versus the CL13, 1515, at DDR4 2133? You'll have to watch the next video to find that out. I'm not going to spoil everything, but I did test it at least a little bit between the two. And I'll tell you in the next video about whether it actually matters. For all of you who have made it this far into the video, thank you. I appreciate you watching my full videos. It really does make a difference. YouTube uses average percentage of a video as watch time to determine whether or not a video is popular. If only five minutes of a video like this gets watched, YouTube buries it in their algorithms. It's why I've been trending towards shorter videos and I've stopped making longer videos because the average watch time of these videos is pretty poor, all things considered. But this is kind of a special case and a special build, and I thought, okay, I'll do part two as a long video, and I'll sit here and I'll just talk and ramble and share all of my thoughts about a variety of things. Part three and part four will be much shorter. Part three will be overclocking. Part four will be the game benchmarks. It'll have charts, and I will have short snippets of gameplay in those five games. You'll get to see the temps and performance and benchmarks, but it will still be, I'm going to try. We'll see if I can keep that to a 10 minute video. And that actually might be the last video in this series. It, productivity doesn't make a lot of sense on a build like this. I mean, you can, but it really doesn't. And since I didn't do the build video, it might just be four parts. In any case, like this video if you like it, share it with your friends if you loved it. Remember to subscribe to my channel with a big huge red button directly below. Hit that bell notification icon to be notified of all of my videos. Otherwise, frankly, YouTube doesn't send out a lot of notifications. Comments in the comment section down below. Check the links in the video description. Links to all of this stuff to Amazon and Newegg. Those are affiliate links. They do support the channel. Use them when shopping. Even if you end up buying a Ryzen 5, it does make a difference. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next video.